please welcome to the stage the president of Vanderbilt Alumni Association, Billy Ray Caldwell Jr., the president of Vanderbilt Student Government, Wyatt Smith, <laughs> Chancellor Nicholas Zeppos, and our 2010 Senior Class Day speaker, Haled Jose. Dear members of the class of 2010, my name is Neelam Khan and I welcome you on behalf of the Interfaith Council. Vanderbilt's Interfaith Council has always aimed to foster dialogue and understanding among students of different faiths. As you sit here today reflecting on your four years at Vanderbilt, I ask each of you a question. How has your faith changed? Whether or not you identify with a specific faith tradition, each of us has a personal set of values and beliefs that defines who we are and what we are here to do on this earth. And whether or not you believe in one God, several gods, no God, or an unknown God, upon leaving this significant chapter of our lives, it is important to assess our beliefs as they once were and as they are today. Now we will have four members of the class of 2010 reflect upon different aspects of the journey in life, the journey in faith, that we have all made together in the past four years at Vanderbilt. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Karthik Devarajan, and I will be welcoming you on behalf of the Hindu community at Vanderbilt. I'll be reading the poem, Where the Mind is Without Fear, by Rabindranath Tagore. Where the mind is without fear, and the head is held high. Where knowledge is free. Where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic wars where words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards collective perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way to the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever-widening thought and action. Into that heaven of freedom, let our country awake. <clears throat> Shalom. Hello. I'm Jesse Solomon, a member of the Jewish community at Vanderbilt. During our time here, we have all formed connections and we have all made friends, creating what we call in Judaism, Kehila Kedosha, our blessed community. As we journeyed through our years here, our Kehila Kedosha has brought us to many important milestones. In the Jewish tradition, as we reach these milestones, we give thanks by saying a prayer called the Shehechianu. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Haolam, Shehechianu Vikiyamanu, Vihigianu Lazman Hazed. Blessed are you, Adonai our God, ruler of the universe, who has granted us life, sustained us, and enabled us to reach this occasion. I greeted you with Shalom, I leave you with shalom. Hello, goodbye, and peace. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the most merciful, the most gracious. Assalamu alaikum. Peace and blessings be upon you. My name is Amira al Samadisi, and I am a member of the Muslim community here at Vanderbilt. Throughout our time here, we have been challenged in many ways, physically, emotionally, and mentally. We have faced trials and hardships and have been forced to contemplate our faith and our own morality. 
Through these moments of difficulty, however, it is our faith that allows us to, and gives us relief, that allows us to persevere and give us relief. As the Holy Quran states, Verily, with hardship, there is relief. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, good morning. My name is Garrett Spiegel, and I'm a member of the Christian community here at Vanderbilt. In an effort to point our thoughts toward the future and our mindset therein, the Hebrew text of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament of the Bible offers us this. Since no man can tell the future, who then can tell him what is to come? In the same light, Jesus states in the Gospel according to Matthew, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or what you will wear? Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. So as our journey through college closes, I urge you to look to the future and remember the past, but live in the present and enjoy today. Congratulations. Good morning, Vanderbilt faculty, staff, alumni, parents, and graduating students. My name is Billy Ray Caldwell, and I am currently the president of your alumni association. First, to the class of 2010, I'd like to congratulate you on all that you've accomplished. Tomorrow's a big day. Parents, whew, congratulations to you too. Mostly, though, I would like to welcome the graduating class of 2010 to the Alumni Association. Tomorrow is a big day. I know most of you are asking yourselves, what is the Alumni Association and what does it mean to me? Well, consider the Alumni Association your extended family. We have chapters all over the United States and several countries around the world. We are anywhere you want to be. Are you moving to a new city after graduation? Are you interested in knowing who's there that you can connect with? Do you want to know the ins and outs of that new city? Or maybe look at an old city in a new way? The Alumni Association, all 130,000 of us, is there to help. Each chapter schedules events throughout the year. There are educational events where we bring in professors to talk about current topics. There are events that highlight the highlights of each city. And of course, we have game viewings and happy hours for those of you that want to get acquainted. So you may be asking, how do I make the most out of this opportunity? I'm glad you asked. Get involved. Can you imagine a better way to network than getting connected with people that are also graduates of Vanderbilt? I know many of you are going on to graduate studies or already have secured positions, but the opportunity to network among people with whom you have the Vanderbilt connection is invaluable at every stage of your life. Quick story about me. Ten years ago, a friend of mine had one year left on his term for the Nashville Chapter Steering Committee. He had to leave for a job. He said, would you mind filling out one year? In a weak moment, I said, sure. Well. That weak moment was the most rewarding decision I've ever made in my life. I have worked with graduates from 60 years of Vanderbilt across all the schools. And those connections have significantly enhanced my life and my Vanderbilt education. Now that you know my story, I hope you too will get involved and find out what the Alumni Association can do for you. So this year, the seniors joined with the Alumni Association in giving back to Vanderbilt through the Senior Class Fund. Here to make the Senior Class Fund presentation is former Vanderbilt Student Government President and graduating senior, Wyatt Smith. Good morning, fellow graduates, friends, and distinguished guests. My name is Wyatt Smith and I'm the former president of Vanderbilt Student Government. 
On behalf of the class of 2010, I'd like to welcome you to our Senior Day festivities. This morning I had the honor of presenting the Senior Class Fund gift to the Vanderbilt community. This fund represents the class of 2010's desire to give back to Vanderbilt and reinvest in the experience that's meant so much to all of us. It is a collection of individual gifts made by seniors supporting the areas of Vanderbilt that matter. This year's campaign was led by seniors Alex Parker, Alex Bettis, Nicole Nunziato, and Stacey Griffith. Thank you to all four of you for your leadership in ensuring this fund was successful. Our goal this year focused on achieving 30% participation from our class, a Vanderbilt record. As of this morning, we are at 443 donors, representing 30.4% of the senior class. Together we have raised $20,264.74, supporting 84 different areas of the university. Congratulations. <laughs> Chancellor Zeppos, could you please join me at the podium? On behalf of all of us who've made gifts to the Senior Class Fund, we'd like to present you with this framed mat of our signatures and thank you for all of your work in ensuring that Vanderbilt is the wonderful place we love so much. Thank you very much, Bob. In many ways, it's difficult for us to believe uh, that this day has come. And as we gather together in celebration, really remembering the past successes of our classmates and celebrating those in the making, we are mindful of how much this university has allowed us to grow as individuals over the past several years. You know, as Vanderbilt students, we're very proud of the balance that our university offers. Uh, there's no other institution in the country that boasts the same level of academic excellence, local and international service, SEC athletics, Nashville's music scene, and of course a grand tradition called Raging. <laughs> now as a class, we've lived this balance together over the past four years. The memories we carry from shared experiences, studying late nights for tests, going alternative service break trips, or simply enjoying a Thursday night exploring downtown Nashville with friends, provide each of us with great appreciation for the role this university has played in shaping our friendships and the people we have become today. But still, in this moment of celebration, we are mindful of the challenge that Vanderbilt bestows on us as graduates, to live our lives in a way that makes the world a better place. As this semester marked great tragedies, including the death of close friends and the floods of Nashville, which rocked our, our community just a week ago, our class responded by bonding together and offering support wherever possible. So even as we each feel some trepidation about leaving familiar surroundings and moving forward into a very uncertain world, we do so confident in the knowledge that Vanderbilt has equipped us with the tools and skills we need to be successful in the challenges ahead. With an eye to that future, I have the privilege of introducing the man who works every day to ensure that Vanderbilt students have the tools they need to succeed. Chancellor Nicholas Zeppos has been with Vanderbilt for 22 years. He began his service here as an assistant professor of law in 1987. Subsequently, he served as an associate dean and then associate provost before being named provost and vice chancellor for academic affairs in 2002. Upon being named chancellor in the spring of 2008, Chancellor Zeppos led our university through a tumultuous economic climate with great skill, never wavering in his commitment to making the Vanderbilt experience affordable and transformative for all its students. I would like to specifically recognize Chancellor Zeppos for his efforts leading the Student Debt Reduction Initiative, an initiative that has made our university a national leader by promising every qualified student the opportunity for a top 20 education regardless of his or her socioeconomic background. Chancellor Zeppos reinforces this commitment in both word and deed every day, and we all thank him for leading this important initiative as well as countless others to support undergraduates. Ladies and gentlemen, it is, my, it is my honor to introduce the eighth chancellor of Vanderbilt University, Chancellor Nicholas Zeppos.
Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for gathering uh, a little bit early in the morning. I know we were up a little bit late last night. I had some complaints about why the band went off at midnight and why we didn't have someone coming on until 3 in the morning. So we'll work on that next year, but we call that reunion. Um, I also do want to take this moment to recognize this amazing young man, Wyatt Smith, for his leadership as the president of the Vanderbilt Student Government, but really for exemplifying the best of scholarship service and that balance we cherish at Vanderbilt. Wyatt came to Vanderbilt as an Ingram Scholar, a scholarship that is emblematic of service to others. And he has lived that every day at Vanderbilt, on our campus and off of our campus. Uh, I have looked to Wyatt for leadership in so many ways, and I've come to the conclusion I get asked, what do I do? I say, I work for Wyatt Smith. And so thank you so much, Wyatt, for all you do. I, I also want to mention that uh, Wyatt is going on a journey. Many of you are going on to do other things. Wyatt is this year's recipient of the Michael B. Keegan Traveling Fellowship. Through this program, he'll be traveling to six continents. Not and. I guess Antarctica did not make the list, Wyatt. Uh, but with his energy, who knows, he'll end up there. But uh, Wyatt is on a uh, journey to study democracy and post-democratic developments across the globe, starting out in South Africa, looking at post-apartheid social structures, going to Israel to look at the balance between issues of security and issues of equity and fairness. Wyatt honors all of us with his service to the university and the world. We wish you the best. Uh, continuing my theme that I work for Wyatt Smith, uh, he was selected as a young alumni trustee, so I look forward to that continued partnership. I also want to thank the students who participated in our blessing. Uh, Neelam Khan, the president of the Interfaith Council and an arts and science student. Uh, Karthik Davaran, Jessica Solomon, and Maria, uh, Maria, Elsa Medici, and Garrett Spiegel. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> now, this is a time of celebration, of course, mixed feelings for our entire community. You are here, your families are here, the faculty, the staff, members of the Board of Trust, the entire community coming together to celebrate your achievements and your passage on. It's also a time, however, for us to honor the great leaders across the globe, to recognize people, humanitarians, people of all backgrounds and gifts, who have distinguished themselves, as we all hope to do, as contributors to a far better world. We do this through the awarding of the Nichols Chancellor's Medal. This medal was created by Janice and Ed Nichols in memory of Ed's parents, Edward Carmack Nichols and Lucille Hamby Nichols. Ed and Janice wanted, through their act, to honor individuals who, through the quality of their spirit and action, embody the very best character of this 21st century. Ed and Janice are here with us today, and I want to recognize their tireless commitment, their generosity to Vanderbilt, and our mission to teach, lead, and serve. Ed and Janice, we recognize you and thank you for your leadership and service. Now, joining Janice and Ed today are their special guests, Senior Melissa Zhu and David Amsalem. Melissa is the president of the Vanderbilt chapter of the American Red Cross and has dramatically improved the visibility and effectiveness of this organization. David participated in the Kampala Project during his sophomore year. Then he took a semester off to go to Nepal to help design an emergency medical system. Thank you, Melissa and David, for your service to Vanderbilt. Now today, Vanderbilt is
deeply honored, deeply honored to present the 2010 Nichols Chancellor Award Medal to Khaled Hosseini, a world-renowned novelist and physician. A graduate of Santa Clara University, where he earned his bachelor's degree, he then went on to the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine. Khaled is also the author of two best-selling novels, The Kite Runner and A, Splen a Thousand Splendid Sons. Khaled Hosseini was born in Kabul, Afghanistan, where his father was a diplomat with the Afghan Foreign Ministry, and his mother taught Farsi and history at a very large high school. In 1976, his family was relocated to Paris, and in 1980, amid the violent communist coup and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, his family moved to San Jose after being granted asylum, political asylum, in the United States of America. It was during his practice as an internist that Haled began writing that remarkable first novel, The Kite Runner. This moving story, moving story of two young boys growing up in Kabul and the deep, long-lasting, sustaining friendship they form despite the vast differences in financial and social status went on to become an international bestseller and has been published in 48 countries. Upon the novel's success, Haled made the decision to put his medical career on hold and devote full time to his family and his writing. He has since penned a second novel, A Thousand Splendid Sons, which has been published now in over 40 countries. Haled Hosseini has distinguished himself as a humanitarian of the first order and was named as a goodwill envoy for the Office of the United States High Commissioner for Refugees in 2006. He has traveled with the UN to Eastern Chad to aid refugees from the Darfur conflict. And in September 2007, he returned to his native Afghanistan to support return, returning refugees from northern Afghanistan. Inspired by this trip, he currently devotes his passion and his gift for healing by providing much needed humanitarian assistance through his own efforts in Afghanistan and through the Haled Hosseini Foundation. As Chancellor, it is my distinct honor to present the Nichols Chancellor's Medal to this great humanitarian, Haled Hosseini, in tribute to the full body of his work and by his exemplifying, as we all aspire to do, the very best qualities of the human spirit through his many contributions to society. Halev, will you please come up here? Thank you very much. Thank you, Chancellor Zeppos. Um, I actually don't work for Wyatt Smith, but maybe I should after <laughs> that endorsement. Um, you know, before I begin, I, uh, I want to reflect uh, and, and take a moment um, to just reflect on the challenges and hardships that this city and this state have faced in the recent flood. Um, I'm not alone. Uh, in my concern about your neighbors, uh, your colleagues, and your friends who've been affected by this uh, disaster. Those close to the crisis and those watching from afar are moved uh, by the way that neighbors in this region have banded together uh, to care for one another. And on this day, my very best thoughts are with you. Um, it's really great, uh, you know, to be part of this ceremony that is um, goes on despite the trials of the last uh, week. Um, and I want to thank you for, for having me here in Vanderbilt. It's a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank the university for giving me the opportunity um, to speak to you and to, to address uh, people who are on the verge of taking their ideas and their ambitions to the greater world abroad. 
you know, it's, it's my privilege to maybe provoke you to thought one more time uh, before you leave the home of your formal education. Um, on the eve of your graduation from, from Vanderbilt, one of the most distinguished houses of learning in this nation, I, I want to ask you a question about, you know, why do we educate? Why do institutions go through the effort and the money and all the energy uh, to build colleges and universities um, to recruit the best and the brightest and to teach them to the best of their ability? Why do you guys, the students, work years to get admitted and then you scrounge around for funds so that you can attend the school and then spend a fifth of your young lives in study? You, you guys might say, well, you know, because education is the key to greater opportunity, to prosperity. Education is where I get the skills I need, and, the, and I get a degree that stands as a mark of my experience and, and my knowledge. But what about you know, the rest of us? What do we have in stake at, in this process? You know, why should we teach? Why should we contribute to our alma maters? Why, you know, should we mentor young people coming out of college? And the answer is that the college and its graduates are part of our community. The people who learn today are going to work and exercise their ambitions tomorrow. We all have a vested interest in supporting the best thinkers and the best learners in our community. You know, I remember my own education and the countless people who were there for me, who supported me, and who contributed to who I am today and what I've accomplished. So I recognize there's a debt that I owe. In other words, you know, we have an appreciation for the process of learning. And I want to talk for just a minute about what learning means. And that's something you've all been doing for the last four years in this school. To me, learning is change. It's not an elaboration on a familiar set of knowledge. Learning occurs in those moments when we meet revelations. Learning is unexpected. Learning is a challenge to what you know or what you think you know. It's not a confirmation of it. Learning is a remapping of the world around you. And learning is not always comfortable. You know, it can alarm you, it can make you angry, but it will always make you think. Here in school, you know, you've been lucky to have people to support you and to help you confront these moments and these challenges. But as you leave, bear in mind that you're not done yet and that wherever you go, these challenges are going to seek you out and they're going to find you. And the real test of your education here in Vanderbilt is how you're going to face these challenges on your own. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I'll give you the example of, of, of the burqa, which is the full body veil that has brought you know, so much media attention to Afghanistan. And you know, in the West, the burqa has become kind of this familiar and iconic symbol of female oppression. And a couple of years ago, a friend of mine came back from Afghanistan and she'd gone there to uh, found a nonprofit uh, to help Afghan women. And she told me that you know, before she went, she had these very strong visceral feelings about the burqa. And it represented for her all that was wrong and all that was vexing about the situation of women in Afghanistan. It was for her um, a, a reliable barometer uh, for social change in Afghanistan. And she felt as things for women get better, people will shed the burqa. But she said that after she lived there for a while, she came to see that all the media attention about the burqa and what it had received in the West was actually out of proportion with the reality that she found in Afghanistan. And she found that the burqa was actually more important to her than it was to many women in Afghanistan. And she found that for many women she met, unveiling was actually not a, a primary preoccupation. And they had other priorities. You know, they were worried about, they were more worried about food, about shelter, about clean water, about education and healthcare. 
And many who wore the burqa were actually very thoughtful, strong, decisive, and capable women. And so she came to see that just because a woman wore the veil didn't necessarily mean that she was not you know, an active participant in her own future. And this was not easy for her to accept. It, it challenged her preconceived notions. But she left herself open to the challenge um, and open to a shift in the way that she perceived the world. And that's what learning is. And that's going to happen to you. And you're going to have these moments whether you seek them out or not. And you won't be able to avoid them. You won't be able to avoid them because we live in a much smaller world today. Because of technology, we're far more connected than we were in the past to other people, other countries, other cultures. Even if you're the kind of person who's more comfortable in a small community, even if you're the kind of person who avoids you know, discussing political topics at a dinner table, even if you read only those publications and those writers who share your opinions, new ideas and new points of view are going to find you. And you won't have a choice about that. But what you do with these challenges is your choice. And that's, you know, that's not a question to take lightly. The easier, easiest thing is to just ignore facts and feelings um, that don't match up with your idea of yourself and the world. And we spend a lot of time, a lot of our life, um, building up our perception of people and events. And when something is kind of out of step with that perception, it, it, it may seem like too much work to go back and rewrite everything. But in fact, that's what you've been practicing to do here in Vanderbilt for the last four years. And while leaving school may seem like the time to set your thoughts and your, your, your practices in stone, I would say that it's actually the time to experience and to experiment. And now that you're leaving these walls, I can think of no better way to honor your education and your learning than to use your skills to make this world a better place than, what, than the way you found it. Because you get to determine the size of your world. It can be just you, or it could be your family, or your school. It can be your country. It can be your gender. It can be the people who share your opinions. Your world could be the people who share your interests, or people who share a, maybe a, a difficulty with you, maybe an illness. But it can be much more. And I would urge you, um, as, uh, throughout your lives, to expand your knowledge by always expanding your community. And a community is not just a bunch of people who have things in common. A community is a complicated organism, and it requires different people and different points of view in order to thrive. A complete community needs people who work with their hands and people who work with their minds. It needs an older generation that's had years of experience, and it needs new blood to bring in innovation. It needs people who are cautious and people who are bold. It needs women and it needs men. It needs loyalists and it needs critics. But very importantly, a community has to recognize want and care for its own. And sometimes the people in a community who need the most help are the hardest to see. Or as a fable goes, they're those who cry out the least and suffer the most. So I'm going to ask something difficult of you. I'm going to ask that you seek out people in your community who are in need. And I'm going to ask you to try not just to understand them, but to help them. It's hard to make a connection with people who are suffering. It requires you to take on some of that pain for yourself. It makes you forge a kinship with misfortune and to see how it could happen to you and how it would make you feel. You know, and there's an impulse to turn away from a beggar on the street, and we've all done that, or from disturbing images on the TV screen. This impulse comes partly from this pain that we feel, absolutely. But, and this has to be said, I think it also comes from apathy. And Apathy's insidious and enormously negative power. 
It was Helen Keller who said that science may have found a cure for most evils, but it has found no remedy for the worst of them all, the apathy of human beings. Now, is this because we want to refute our connection to other people's problems? Have we, you know, in this industrialized world, become lulled? Are we kind of like these tranquilized people who, who, who have no time to think of the hardship of people who are less fortunate than us? The great physician William Osler said that by far the most common foe we have to fight is apathy, indifference from whatever cause, not from a lack of knowledge, but from carelessness, from absorption in other pursuits, from a contempt bred of self-satisfaction. And it's easy to stage a dialogue in your mind, knowing that troubles exist and you're far away, but not knowing how you can help. And the argument goes something like this. It, you know, I didn't do anything uh, to contribute to this problem, so why should I feel responsible? Or you can say, you know, I don't have the time or the money to fix this problem. And I think there's a real element of, the, of truth in this picture of how apathy comes to be. Or maybe it has to do with not refuting the connection, but with the pain that we feel because we know the connection is there. Because we don't want to know that pain firsthand and the easiest thing to do is to just not deal with it. Or maybe apathy comes from the belief that we're helpless. The suffering is pervasive and a way of life on this planet as long as there have been people on this planet. Poverty and the associated suffering are ubiquitous and inevitable in the human experience. The suffering in this world is so widespread and often of such mass scale that we feel defeated by it and we slowly turn fatalistic and we lose our sense of moral urgency. You know, why try when we can't change anything anyway? But I would say that we need to be open to this pain because when we are, we have no choice but to help. It becomes our pain. And this is a difficult process because it requires not just knowledge and not just learning, but very importantly, it requires imagination. And then for that, for imagination, we need the tools to help us make that connection, to take something that is abstract and make it real. I know that in college, all of you have taken courses that will prepare you for a specific career. Um, and that's fine. But a full education requires humanities. It requires art. And the reason why those courses are given to you in this university is that art is a window into the mind of other people who are very different from you. And I think in that regard, the novel has a very unique ability. I, a couple of years ago, I read a book called What is the What? by uh, Dave Eggers. And it's a book about the, the uh, trials of a South Sudanese refugee uh, during Sudan's devastating civil war. What I knew about that war um, uh, and, and the plight of the people of South Sudan, I, I knew uh, came from basically random newspaper articles. But after I read Dave Eggers' book, with its humanity and its humor and its compassion, that war came to me in a very real way every night when I sat down to read that book. And it made it impossible for me to gloss over um, the suffering of the people of South Sudan because suddenly I felt like I knew who they were. With regards to my own books, you know, I get letters from India, from Tel Aviv, from Sydney, from London, and from Nashville. And people tell me they want to send money to Afghanistan. You know, one reader told me he wanted to adopt an Afghan orphan. And to me, you know, it's a great honor when readers write to me and say that Afghanistan for them is now more than just you know, the caves of Tora Bora and the poppy fields of Helmand, and that they've come to see Afghanistan as more than just another chronically afflicted, troubled nation. And in these letters, I see the unique ability that art, especially the novel, has to connect people through um, universal human experiences. So the arts are key in creating understanding and compassion um, that drives you to help. But what comes next? 
you have to have a practical course and some action that you can take. You know, and a mantra of the world of volunteer work and philanthropy is the idea of the give 5%. It can be 5% of your time or 5% of your money. It's you know, a very small piece of your luck and your prosperity that you owe back to your community. It's something that all of us can manage. If you work 40 hours a week, two hours spent with somebody who's less fortunate than you can make a world of difference. And I know that this is a tall order, and it's a, a lot to ask of people who already have a lot on their plate. You, know, you have not inherited an easy world, and right now you might be wondering how you're going to face all the, the changes that your life has in store for you. But I would say that to consider other people is not an additional burden, but rather an increased opportunity to be appreciated for who you are, and what you're capable of. When you see the difference that you make in other people's world, you become alive to the changes that you can make in your own. And it's a way to be strong, it's a way to be wise, and to know the measure of your own powers. You can also think of it as a chance to give the part of you um, that sparkles the brightest. If you're, say, a great writer or an avid reader, it's an opportunity to take your love and your skill and tutor in literacy. If you're good with your hands, maybe there's a house that needs building. If you're outgoing and you're charismatic, why not use that skill to make phone calls and connect with people and engage others in your cause? Within the limits of my own set of skills, I have tried to do that uh, on my own. I've tried to engage people around the world in, in my cause through the foundation which was inspired by a, a uh, 2007 trip that I made to Afghanistan as a goodwill envoy for the United Nations Refugee Agency. I went to northern Afghanistan and I met people who have come back to Afghanistan after 10, 20 years of living in Iran and Pakistan, fleeing the Taliban and the, and the wars. And I'd come back to Afghanistan and they were living in, in, in the middle of nowhere, in a desert, on their tents or in cardboards, on less than a dollar a day. Uh, with no access to, to schools or, 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 or health care um, or food. And they spent winters living in, 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 in holes that they had dug on the ground. In the villages that I visited, the elders told me that they routinely lost 10 to 15 children every winter to the freezing temperatures. And I'm a dad, and for me, as a dad, it was overwhelming and heartbreaking. As, a, as an Afghan, I felt connected to these people suffering and I decided to do what I could to advocate for these people and to give them a sense of control over their own lives and to provide them with some basic services, especially shelter and education, so that they can get on with the business of rebuilding their broken country. Uh, my work with this foundation would be impossible without the help of individuals. And today I want to thank two specific uh, individuals. Um, I want to extend my heartfelt gratitude to Ed um, and Janice Nichols for their general support and their warm interest in the cause of the Afghan people. You have certainly honored me personally, but far more importantly, your generous contribution will reach and change many lives in Afghanistan, especially those of, of women and children who remain the most vulnerable and the most underserved groups. So I thank you both, uh, both on my behalf and on theirs. Uh, and in closing, for the rest of you, now I wish you good fortune, I wish you prosperity, and I wish you excitement in your new lives. I look forward to seeing what your generation is going to accomplish with your great capacity to connect and to imagine. I know I have a lot to learn from you in the coming years, and I know that together we'll continue our education in the community of the world, where we can see ourselves in fellow human beings, uh, be it uh, in pain or in passion or in hope. And today I'm, I'm honored to consider myself um, part of your community. Thank you so much.
Well, thank you, Haled, for that inspiring uh, and wise speech, and we take your messages with great hope. Um, as you know, our commencement activities will continue today. I see some uh, eager graduates, but you and your families and friends, one last opportunity to go to Wilson Hall and participate. You may need a few credits. Participate in some faculty seminars with our outstanding faculty uh, who will be talking about some of the most interesting topics uh, that our, our world faces. Uh, I would ask you to be safe, enjoy these last moments uh, as a student, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow on your very special day. Thank you. Thank you.